so we're filming this once we've, uh, well, nearly at the end of this section of the video. But this is obviously going to start. So, uh, what, what, what did we originally start off thinking this video was going to be? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think you can't overstress how exhausted this has been. So, uh, it all started off when uh, there was a leaking cooling pipe. Now, that's not unusual on a car that's 30 years old. However, once we fixed one, the next one started to fail. And uh, then, sure enough, uh, the car became harder to start and uh, leaking more and more often. We got through a radiator. It came to a head when the uh, car lost its coolant and uh, was allowed to run a little hotter than would be desirable. What we then found, it became harder to start, more and more smoky, and rougher idle, rougher idle, and uh, so at that point we needed to uh, explore what had happened. But what we started to notice with this is that when you took the oil cap off, the uh, the jet of hot, oily fumes was almost like a leaf blower. Um, so that was obviously the first sign, and that's what I understand we call blow-by. And that's where the crank case gases are such that combustion gases are escaping along the side of the piston, pressurising the crank case, and then it leads through the easiest route. What I identified was that we actually saw that the coolant uh, head tank was pressurising. A little bit of water overflow is not too much of a problem. But when we took it off, it gushed out. So we then, as you'll see in the video, bought a combustion gas test kit. But if they contain a high quantity of hydrocarbons, then that suggests that those are combustion gases and that tells you you've got a failed head gasket. The next few minutes of video are us going through the systematic process of working via a Haynes Haynes manual and taking the engine apart. Now obviously we've never done this before, this is my full time job, nor is it yours, so we have to make the best of it and sometimes it's required gaps in between each process just to check that we're doing it correctly. Anyway, so far so good. And what you'll find is the next few minutes are us mulling that problem over and then we'll reach a conclusion as to what we need to do with this. Right, so we'll get back in probably about 8 minutes and 50 seconds. Right. Right, go. Right. This is the head gasket job, obviously. Now, so far, I've removed the inlet and the exhaust manifold. And those bolts came out relatively easily because they've been soaking in rust penetrative spray. So that was easy. The other side was all the fuel injection um, mechanism, and that's all been removed. There you go, there, and I'll cover that up shortly. So the next challenge is to remove the, the uh, or consider the mechanism for, for moving, removing the, uh, the head. Now there's obviously, the thing you have to remember is, so far as I understand, I've never done this before, is to make sure that uh, the cylinder block is at top dead centre, so that when you take the sprocket off, if you lose the place, you can readjust as necessary. There's a camshaft locking tool on its way, which locks the other end so that when you undo this bolt it doesn't rotate and keeps the relative timing. So there's a couple of things I'm uh, a bit of a loss as to how to do so far. The first one being turning the engine over because it seems to, uh, obviously the, the mechanism is to put a, um, a socket on the crank pulley, but as you do that it doesn't seem to want to be able to rotate. So that's a bit of a concern, I've never known that, no, that's the fan, not the uh, crank pulley. No, I'm sure anything. Right, so then obviously these are the head bolts, these have to come off in a particular order. I've also got a... Uh, Spare camshaft, which is over here, a brand new Vauxhall one, so I might as well stick that in. It's a bit rusty, but I'm sure that'll be fine once it's because uh, the profile of that, if you look at those lobes, they're nice and sharp. I'm not sure you can pick that up, whereas on there, they're nice, they're very smoothed off, suggesting that uh, that one's worn out, which might give um, power, power problems perhaps. Um, but yes, anyway, so that's uh, that's where we are today. 
So I think the next thing to do, whilst I've waiting for the cam locking tool to come, is replace this alternator, which I've got a new one of, because that one's not giving me adequate charge. Now, by all accounts, this was had its uh, diode pack replaced a couple of years back, but I'm not sure how you could get to that very easily. So uh, that's today's challenge. Now that little connector there is to do the timing tensioner, timing chain tensioner. Oh! Uh, well, anyway, uh, I'll pick that up later. And uh, the only casualties so far are two slept bolts. The first one goes in there, like so. You can see there, that's a healthy, uh, that's a healthy uh, length. But this one has snapped. How much has it snapped? Well, if you look at there, you can see it's just snapped slightly below this aluminium casting. But aluminium castings and aluminium is notoriously dreadful for uh, causing that kind of problem. So it's going to help us get the head off very easily, but the challenge is going to be how we get the stub of the that nut out of this aluminium casting. I'm not too sure how much of that is actually needed to be honest with you, but you can see there it's, it's almost completely flush with that chain, and nice good old cars have two duplex chain, two of them, so if one snapped the other might save things or it would actually reduce the likelihood of snapping in the first place. If we now then wonder, because if you use, uh, if you have an engine with a cam belt, one of the first or best things is to line up all the different markings on the on the flywheel I've aligned it so that the engine's at top dead centre. We've got this uh, camshaft and there's a locating down here, which means it's impossible to put it in place. So by all accounts, the trick is to take this uh, sprocket and chain and use some cable ties to make sure it can't possibly move. So if you take that off, then the timing relative to the bottom of the engine will always be correct. And the timing with respect to the camshaft can't go wrong for as long as the dowel is lined up with the, hole, the corresponding hole on here. So we have a locking tool to enable the... There we go. The locking tool fits on the end of the camshaft like so. And that enables you to turn the back bolt there and get sufficient purchase on it to stop the camshaft turning in the engine which will, which will turn the top. So far then, the next stage is, once we've removed that, is to undo these bolts in a particular order, which is defined, I think it's in a spiral motion. Now, I suspect this is going to give us big troubles because that head is made out of cast iron and cast iron is incredibly heavy. It's the lifting of it might be a job for several people, but it's getting a purchase on it to enable it to lift it. I think that's going to be quite a job. Go. Yo. Right, so what I've done now is I've used the breaker bar to crack the bolts off, uh, or, and all of them have come off with the seemingly little incident. They all made a nice satisfying crack. And what I'm doing now is I'm just uh, using the ratchet to just undo in a spiral motion. So you start over there and then it relieves the tension on the head as you do that. So all is well so far and uh, hopefully it should be okay. So let's uh, carry on. Yeah. So, undone, these are all the bolts, and uh, I've given it a tap with my hide hammer to uh, free the mating surfaces. And now look at this. There you are, so it's free to come out. <sighs> right, so let's see how we have it. Oh, I think we need to get broke out of the you business. Got a problem because you got the. Oh, okay. Hang on. <laughs> right. Which way we're we going towards the front? Yeah, finally. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, 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 okay
Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, latest uh, instalment. We've, as you can see, we've taken the head off. Now there's one casualty of which is the bolt. So I put that. I've put some of this uh, Amazon's finest uh, penetrating catalyst liquid. Oh yes. So I put some of that on it. So I've saved that. Saved, uh, soak that for a couple of days we've taken the head off and uh, I can see there's a couple of things spring to mind this one's very smoky uh, so presumably that suggests some kind of issue perhaps associated with valve seats valve timing something like that um, and obviously these are the cylinders now again if we look a little bit closer I'll put some uh, liquid on that to see if we can see what's happened and uh, hopefully there isn't particularly an obvious sign although perhaps there's a bridge between the cylinders but it's hard to work out where the water's getting in although this one was clearly full of water or rather antifreeze so that's probably it Right, dark light's not great, but uh, I think, let's just see. Well, I need to get the right angle just to check that the light is there, but, but uh, this inside of this cylinder is very scratched. Um, oh, there we are. That's probably about as good as it's gonna get. Whereas this one, which is next to it, is, looks what I understand to be fine. So I think that's definitely, one of the issues so I'm just wondering how to resolve that that probably was one of the issues it had and obviously that one was covered in soot so uh, let's see what it happens right <clears throat> now as you'll have seen we, we've taken all this apart and that was all very well and fine now you may see on the on the picture that'll come up in a second that this second piston along which is ultimately well it's still the only one we can actually see we don't really know what this one's like and we don't know what that one's like but certainly looking at this one we've seen there's heavy scoring and heavy scoring uh, tells you that at some point the engine's got really really hot and uh, as a result of that the expansion causes the piston to grind on the inner surface of this cylinder and that's where you get the scoring as a result of the up and down motion so that really told us that you either needed to replace these wet liners I didn't realize how expensive that was um, or rebore it that's a lot cheaper but if you do that you need some new pistons and new rings and then of course once you've taken that apart you've then got the issue associated with what state the crankshaft and the the bare big end bearings are going to be in as well so really it struck me that the ultimate solution to all of this was to get a new block now obviously this car was a rare car 30 years ago there are barely any diesel Carltons mainly because there wasn't any point in having one the petrol engine was quite good petrol wasn't uh, too expensive they're a lot smoother you can have an automatic petrol which you can't obviously have an automatic diesel in this country anyway so the case for buying a diesel is much greater what is that noise so anyway so I did manage to find one, believe it or not. It was this chap on eBay who was advertising parts for a Bedford CF van. And this engine, this 2.3 diesel, appears in a couple of cars in, in the UK. The first one is the Bedford CF van, which is the one that looks a bit like the 18 van from the 80s. The next one is the Vauxhall Frontera. And uh, the one after that is this Carlton. And obviously, for reasons explained, not many people have the diesel car. So this black man was listing uh, spare parts for a bed for CFR. So I said, by any chance, have you got the uh, diesel engine 2.3 DTR, which is the code for this one? And he said, sure enough, yes he had, 200 pounds. So we went and fetched it, and while I was there, 
had a great long conversation with him. It was a very interesting chap and uh, seemed to dedicate his life to all matters associated with his engine, of all things. Anyway, and he was said, What's, what caused the problem? I said, well, one of the issues was that the engine had got hot. He said, yeah, well, that's probably where you get this scoring from. And he said, and I said, but the other issue that uh, I was told about is that prior to my ownership, um, that the car had been driven through a flood. And by all accounts, it carried on and all was fine. However, he said, oh, that's interesting. You've driven through a flood and all was fine. That's very rare. And he said, if I were you, I'd very carefully look at the height of the pistons. So this is one and four when they are at the top. And sure enough, as the picture you'll see in a minute would indicate, this piston here at the front is pretty much flush with the top of the block. This protrudes probably about half a millimeter, if not a full millimeter more. Now they should be the same height. So what this chap suggested was that if some water had managed to get into the bore, being sucked through, then it would become hydrolocked, thereby shrinking at least that piston and possibly others. So we don't know whether that scoring was caused by a bent connection rod or the, high, the overheating that we described earlier. However, what's interesting in all of this is it could actually be both and it certainly strengthens the case that we were absolutely right to consider getting a new engine block. So this one is completely ruined, this one is perfectly fine, although it has got quite a substantial ridge suggesting that the engine has been tired for a long time. And if we think how long that actually took to start, and I think we have got a video of that when we first had it actually, we'll put that up. Um, um, when it first started it used to crank over for a long time loads and loads of smoke and then eventually after a couple of minutes it would actually start to, to function as a car so as a result of that we think that part of the damage is historical part of the damage is recent and I think what's notable is the ease with which this came apart suggests that I'm not the first person to try and fix this problem and I'm suggesting that perhaps someone in the last five years or so has had a go at trying to fix this very problem before. Probably just fix the head gasket and uh, probably that is why it hasn't lasted very long. Now the other thing that made me realise that checking that uh, height of the pistons was a good idea is that there are three versions of the head gasket for this engine. A 1.4, no I think it's a 1.3, a 1.4 and a 1.5 millimetre thickness and it, you have to determine which one you've got. Now we've got the one, the way you can tell is there's uh, on the head gasket there are some markings on it. And we've got the 1.4 which is the mid one, so I've got a new one of those coming. Um, but anyway, so the point of it is we've got to replace this block and I'll show you in a minute the new one that we've got for uh, its replacement. We've got to replace this block, but that's not too much of a disaster because it needed a new clutch anyway. So looking at all of this, I think if we remove all this stuff here, perhaps not the anti-lock brakes thing, that's probably uh, more bother than we could do with. But if we remove all of this, um, then we can replace the clutch, replace the block and uh, go from there. So we'll now show you the video of it starting and then we'll show you the new engine. Right, see you in a minute. Right, go. Right now, like everyone, with an old Volvo, you need, an old, you need to carry around a spare engine with you. So, so here we go. 850 TDI, in case you are interested. <coughs> <It's run. laughs> anyway, here is the uh, engine. And uh, as you can see there, the light's quite harsh. The light's very harsh, but if you come round this side, perhaps what you'll see is that uh, we have four, just about probably make that out, four healthy bores, no scoring, only a minor ridge, and uh, hopefully you can see there, complete, right. complete, comes complete with head oh. gasket, so that's nice. It's focusing on the dirt on the window instead. Mm, yeah, well. 
I'm not going to, I'm not in particularly inclined to move that round uh, because clearly it's going to be very heavy but it's definitely the 2.3 DTR. Now this is a Frontier installation so what that tells you is we might need to put the, the sump from the Carlton there because I'm guessing Frontier is a higher. So therefore what that tells you is it's probably more compact so we need to think about that. Um, but looking at that, yeah, new sump. Swap the sumps over. I think I've got a gasket set for that. Although well, it doesn't look much like that, so I might have to get yet another one. Uh, there we are. That's another another expense. Hmm. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so that's the plan. So there we go. So hopefully the next video will be us stripping all the ancillaries off the existing engine, battling taking the engine and gearbox out somehow or other. I haven't quite worked that out yet. And then uh, putting it back together after giving it a bit of a paint job so it looks quite nice to make it all worth all the expense of time. <laughs> goes off that means it's ready to start so you go back and just check the exhaust fumes. Right, you ready? It's very laggy. The government encourages to buy lots of new clean diesels. Oh, that'll do. That'll do. Oh, 